Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video I cover Longstreet's role in the Battle of the Wilderness as the Overland Campaign against Ulysses S. Grant began. On May 1st, 1864, Longstreet attended services at the Episcopal Church at Orange Courthouse, along with Lee and other generals. Longstreet was confirmed a member of the church on that day as well. On May 2nd, Robert E. Lee met with his corps commanders, Longstreet, Richard Ewell, and A.P. Hill atop Clark's Mountain. The army commander told his subordinates that he believed the Union Army would move against their right flank. By May 4th, the Confederate scouts and signalmen could see the roads jammed with infantry, cavalry, and artillery as the mammoth Union Army began maneuvering. Ewell and Hill's corps were closest to the Union movement, so Lee dispatched Ewell along the Orange Turnpike and Hill along the Orange Plank Road to engage the Union Army of the Potomac in the tangled brush and forest of the wilderness. Lee initially ordered Longstreet to follow behind Hill on the Orange Plank Road, but Longstreet thought a better route would allow him to approach the Union left flank and rear, hopefully stopping their movement and maybe sending them back across the river. Lee gave consent, but as the fighting brought the two sides into a bloody stalemate on May 5th, Lee needed Longstreet to come up behind Hill. Between midnight and 1 a.m. on May 6th, Longstreet began his march to support Hill. Charles Field's division led the column. A mistake from one of their guides cost the division time, but Joseph Kershaw's division was close at hand. It was daylight, and Longstreet could hear the sound of battle in the distance. They were roughly three miles away from the fighting. As Longstreet's divisions maneuvered their way along the Orange Plank Road, Hill's corps was surprised by a Union attack early that morning. Lee witnessed the troops streaming back through the woods toward the Whittle Tap farm, where a significant amount of artillery was placed. Seeing General McGowan and his troops, Lee exclaimed, My God, General McGowan, is this fine brigade of yours fleeing like wild geese? McGowan responded, Sir, my men are not beaten. They want only a place to reform and fight. Lee dispatched aides to hurry Longstreet and his troops along. They found him a half mile from the battlefield, and the columns began to quicken their pace. Moxley Sorrell wrote, I have always thought that the foreman line in the dense brush under fire of the enemy amid the routed men of A.P. Hill and the beating of the enemy under these circumstances was the steadiest and finest thing the Corps ever did. To their chief was due that steadiness as always. The Texas Brigade was one of the first units to make it to the field. Lee could be seen by the Texans in their front and they began to yell, Go back, General Lee. We will not go on if you don't go back. Lee then moved across the plank road and met with Longstreet. After a brief discussion, the old warhorse rode to oversee his attack in columns. In the words of Edward Porter Alexander, the Confederate infantry hit like a whirlwind when they reached the field, pushing back the Federal attackers. One of Tom Gorey's brothers was laying amongst a group of wounded soldiers as Longstreet and his aides passed by. When Longstreet saw how distraught his staffer was, tears could be seen in the General's eyes. Longstreet's push against the Federals was unconventional, but highly effective, he used his first line in the role of skirmishers, but formed a heavy skirmish line so that the men could fire continuously into the blue lines and evade bullets by not having to stand in a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder formation. Behind the heavy skirmishers was the second line, a well-supported formation brigades ready to take advantage of the damage caused by the heavy skirmishers. During the fight, Lee dispatched his chief engineer, Martin L. Smith, to Longstreet. Longstreet sent him on a mission to go south of the Orange Plank Road to find an unfinished railroad cut and scout for a route around the Union left flank. Longstreet then readied an attack force for such a maneuver. Three brigades were found available for the attack, those under George Anderson, William Wofford, and William Mahone. Once Smith finished scouting, Longstreet sent Sorrell with the three brigades to the location for an attack against the Union flank. He told Sorrell, Hit hard when you start, but don't start until you have everything ready. I shall be waiting for your gunfire and be on hand with fresh troops for further advance. Longstreet's flanking movement did exactly what he wanted it to. It rolled up the Union line like a scroll in the words of Alexander. The Union line crumbled and began pulling back. Only pockets of resistance remained in his front. The Confederate attackers halted just south of the Orange Plank Road to reform, except for the 12th Virginia who continued on. Longstreet planned to do the same maneuver again and took off down the Orange Plank Road. The 12th Virginia realized they were alone and isolated, so they began their march back to the road. Their comrades mistook them for the enemy, 
and delivered a volley. At the same time, Longstreet, Moxley Sorrell, Charles Field, Joseph Kershaw, Micah Jenkins, and staff members were riding on the road. The volley was deadly, killing a member of Kershaw's staff and his orderly. A bullet hit Micah Jenkins in the skull. A round passed through Longstreet's shoulder and struck him in the neck. Sorrell remembered that the bullet lifted Longstreet straight up and came down hard on his saddle. Sorrell, Peyton Manning, and Francis Dawson helped the general down from his saddle and laid him against a tree. Blood began to well up in his mouth, but he was able to communicate to Sorrell to report the wounding to Lee. He handed command of the corps to Charles Field and told him of the plan for the attack. Once the blood was stopped, the aides put Longstreet on a stretcher to keep the troops from finding out that the general was wounded. They covered his face with his hat, but the soldiers knew their general's body, and with his face covered, a rumor spread that the general was dead. When some soldiers began to shout that he was dead as the body passed, Longstreet used his left hand to raise the hat from his face. When he did, the soldiers gave a cheer. An artilleryman remembered the scene. I never on any occasion during the four years of the war saw a group of officers and gentlemen more deeply distressed they were literally bowed down with grief, all of them in tears. It was not alone the general they admired who had been shot down, it was rather the man they loved. The general was loaded onto an ambulance and taken from the field. Just a year earlier, nearly to the day, Lee had lost Stonewall Jackson to friendly fire not very far from the spot Longstreet was hit. The flank attack Longstreet explained to Field was postponed, not by Field, but by Lee. Lee saw the entangled mess that the battle lines were in, and ordered Field to put them into a parallel line. As one of Longstreet's biographers explained, in the most difficult of terrain, Longstreet modified his tactical formations, salvaged the army from disaster, routed one enemy line with a rapidly conceived and executed flank attack, and was preparing a final offensive when misfortune denied him. His performance was brilliant, a confirmation of his consummate ability as a tactician. He first traveled to Orange Courthouse, then to Charlottesville, while there, the wife of a staff member remembered, He is very feeble and nervous, and suffers much from his wound. He sheds tears on the slightest provocation, and apologizes for it. He says he does not see why a bullet going through a man's shoulder should make a baby of him. He then went to Lynchburg to a hospital there, but was moved to Lotus Grove, the residence of a Confederate colonel, when a Union army under David Hunter came near the town. On June 14th, Federal cavalry passed by Lotus Grove, not knowing that one of the Confederacy's most famous generals occupied a room in the house. Louise and the children came to stay with him during his recovery. By mid-June, Longstreet telegraphed the War Department that the wound was healing, but his arm still remained paralyzed. He requested permission to travel to Georgia to visit friends, which he was granted. By July, the family was heading south. <laughs>